Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we discuss cases that involve corruption and negligence from the people that we are expected to trust. These cases range from the police ignoring protocol to corporations placing people's lives in jeopardy in order to maximize profits. Today, I'm drinking a lime white cloth, not sponsored. What about you, Jen? I'm drinking a cranberry shandy. Um, Del, the first time I ever had white claw was with you, so that's nice to hear that you're drinking it still. Absolutely. I can't really remember that night too much, but I know that we had fun. We did. We paid $10 to use the bathroom somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so if that doesn't say anything about that night, then I don't know what does. All right, let's get into today's case. The possible wrongful conviction of Julius Jones and the murder of Paul Howell. I first heard about this case a few years ago when I watched the special The Last Defense. I believe it's produced by Viola Davis and it's about the Julius Jones case. And I highly recommend everyone watch it. And I will start off our episode by saying I am of the opinion that Julius is innocent and Dell believes he is guilty. And we'll talk about that a little more um, as we go along. So our case begins on the night of July 28, 1999, when Paul Howell was shot and killed in front of his daughters and sister in the driveway of his parents' home in Edmond, Oklahoma. After a young black man pointed a gun at him and demanded he turn over the keys to his 1997 GMC Suburban. His murderer was described by his sister as a young black man wearing a white t-shirt, red bandana, and a stocking cap with half an inch of hair hanging out of the cap. Howell was a well-respected member of the community and served as a deacon and volunteered at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. The community of Edmond was shaken by Howell's murder and desperately wanted it solved, which put pressure on police. Just two days after the murder, Howell's Suburban was found in a grocery store parking lot in Oklahoma City, which was a nearby city of Edmond. Police utilized confidential police informants for information on Howell's murder. One of their informants was Kermit Lottie, who owned a nearby chop shop, which is just kind of like an auto shop that disassembles stolen vehicles and sells their parts. Lottie said Liddell King, a habitual offender with charges of check fraud known to be involved with chop shops, came by his shop trying to sell a Suburban. But Kermit Lottie refused since there was a murder involving a Suburban that had happened recently. Police spoke to Liddell King, who claimed he was the middleman in the situation. King told police that Chris Westside Jordan came to his apartment the night of the murder and Julius Jones pulled up in a Suburban and asked him to help sell the car. King said Julius was wearing a white t-shirt, red bandana, and stocking cap. King then said he and Julius went to sell the car to Kermit Lottie the following day, but Lottie refused, saying he had heard the car was stolen. King also claims he and Julius left the car in a grocery store parking lot and that Julius confessed to Hal's murder and said that Chris Jordan was the driver and accomplice. All of this led to Chris Jordan being questioned by police, during which he also implicated Julius, saying that Julius had shot Hal while he waited in the car and that they planned to steal a Suburban that night and followed Hal to his home. Let's take a step back and get to know Julius a little more. Julius Jones was a rising sophomore at Oklahoma University, where he received an academic scholarship and was a member of the basketball team. He had been an excellent student in high school and was one of the two black men in the top 10% of his graduating class. Julius had a good head on his shoulders, but he did have minor run-ins with the law for shoplifting and giving a false statement while attempting to get a state ID. And Julius does own up to these mistakes. He and Chris Jordan were high school basketball teammates. But Julius generally stayed away from him because he knew Chris got into trouble and had gang affiliation. The two got closer when Julius was in college, and they had even made a deal that Julius would take the ACT exams for Chris in exchange for extra cash and car rides. Julius describes their friendship as something more more so based on convenience than anything else. The following is Jones's account of events and what he claims is the police's vested interest in his guilt for the murder of Paul Howe. Please remember that Julius has a vested interest in downplaying any role that he had in the murder because he is on death row and looking for a commutation of the sentence. At the time of the murder, Jones says he was at home with his family eating dinner and playing Monopoly. Julius's brother claims Julius was home when he left for work around 9.30 p.m. 
Julius admits he was with Chris Jordan on the night of the murder, but claims it wasn't until 11.30 p.m. Julius alleges that when Jordan picked him up to take him back to his apartment at the OU campus, Jordan said he had gotten into something with someone and that things went wrong. The following day, Julius stated that he received a page from King, who he had only known for about two months, asking him to help move a truck, a Suburban, in return for money. King drove the Suburban while Julius drove King's car to Lottie's chop shop. Julius alleges that he only knew the car was involved in a crime, but not a murder. He admits that this was an immature and foolish thing to do. The night after the murder, Jordan claims he was locked out of his grandmother's house and stayed over at Julius's home, which had never happened before. Julius slept on the couch and Chris slept in Julius's bedroom, leaving early the next morning before Julius awoke. With Lottie, King, and Jordan connecting Julius to Howell's murder, he became the prime suspect to the police. Before they had a warrant, police surrounded Julius's parents' home. A SWAT team, snipers, and news helicopters were there alongside the police. Police, with guns drawn, forced Julius's family out of the home and demanded to know where Julius was, but he was not home at the time. Again, this was all done before the police had a warrant to search the home, but once the warrant was received, just a few hours later, police raided and ransacked the family home. In the process, they broke personal family items and essentially destroyed the Jones house. Julius's his dad claims that ketchup, mustard, and laundry detergent was spilled on the floor by police. His family was shaken up by this, and his brother Antonio said they felt like they were sending a hate message to the police. Sir. It should be noted that Julius was only a suspect at this point. There was no smoking gun or definitive evidence pointing him to the murder, but that would quickly change. Once Chris was arrested, police actually brought him to Julius's house instead of directly to the police station. There, police told him that it would be in his best interest interest to cooperate and in return that he'll get leniency. As Jordan waited in the police car, he gave police suggestions on where in Julius's home to search. Based off his word, police searched the crawl space in Julius's closet and found a pistol wrapped in a red bandana. This only added to the police's case against Julius. Julius was arrested that morning after the raid on his parents' home. He says the day of the raid, police had called his house looking for him. Julius lied to the police saying that he wasn't home and he left his house. It is important to note that Julius does seem to regret this, but it was the norm in his neighborhood to not talk to the police. While he was out, he ran into Jordan and Julius assumed police were after Jordan and his brother. They went to Jordan's brother's house and Julius actually saw his parents' house surrounded by police on the news. And like we said, he was arrested early the next morning. Julius claims police high-fived each other upon his arrest and when he was handed to Two Edmond police by Oklahoma City police, an officer used a racial slur and said, run inward, I dare you. Bob Macy was the Oklahoma County DA at the time of Howe's murder and was notorious for being tough on crime. His nickname was Cowboy Bob and he wore a cowboy hat, bolo tie, and cowboy boots to trial. Soon after Julius's arrest, Macy stated he would seek the death penalty in Julius's case. Julius's trial began on Valentine's Day 2002. He was assigned two public defenders at trial, David McKenzie and Robin Bruno, neither of which had any experience trying a capital murder case. And McKenzie claimed to have been working on around 70 to 80 cases in total at the time of Julius's trial. Julius claims McKenzie did not visit him often in jail, and McKenzie says Julius just wasn't chatty. The state's case revolved around Jordan, who served as the star witness. Kermit Lottie and Liddell King corroborated Chris Jordan's initial story, but Jordan changed the story he told police multiple times, and the facts he presented during the trial were different than what he told police as well. This included denying that he spent the night at Julius's home. The defense tried to prove Jordan was lying, but were unsuccessful. David McKenzie admits he messed up during the cross-examination and kind of just says he had a bad day. This wasn't the only aspect the defense botched. They failed to question Liddell King about his relationship with Julius, they didn't show the jury evidence that Julius's hair was short at the time of the murder, and he therefore wouldn't fit the description of the murderer. They didn't have the red bandana tested for DNA, and they called no witnesses. After the state completed their case, the defense literally said the defense rests, and that was it. And Julius had no idea they would do that.
Mackenzie said Julius's alibi from his family was invalid because of a letter he wrote to his girlfriend while in jail. However, no one is aware of where this letter currently is. Julius and his girlfriend deny this letter was written, and she claims no lawyers ever spoke to her. The jury deliberated for just three to five hours and found Julius and Jordan guilty of murder in the first degree, among other charges. Julius was sentenced to death, and Jordan was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. Julius says in that moment he felt abandoned by God and alone. In return for working with police in this case, Kermit Lottie only served four years of a 40-year federal drug charge sentence after case investigator Tony Fike wrote a letter of leniency for him and claimed, quote, if Lottie didn't help this case, it may still be open, end quote. Liddell King who also turned out to be a police informant, had a fraudulent check charge against him and he served no time, despite the fact that he had three prior felonies and was required to serve at least 20 years. Finally, during the trial, the prosecution told the jury Chris Jordan would serve at least 30 years of his sentence before the possibility of parole. Despite this, Jordan allegedly bragged to fellow inmates that he'd only served 15 years, which he did, and he did not receive any parole or probation after the fact. When Jordan was in prison, two jailhouse witnesses, one facing life without parole and the other on death row, came forward to say that Jordan bragged about essentially setting Julius up and even said Julius wasn't there the night of the crime. In 2007, the Court of Appeals said this information wouldn't have changed the outcome of the verdict. Other appeals were ruled out, and his defense's previous petition for a new trial was denied. Julius's current defense team believes there was a massive racial bias in his case. Like we said, Julius alleged officers called him a racial slur after his arrest. One of the lead investigators on the case, Tony Fike, had a complaint against him from a different case claiming he was racially biased and used excessive force. There was only one black juror, and during jury selection, black jurors were struck by the prosecution for having conflicts of interest, including being crime victims themselves. But white jurors with those same alleged conflicts of interest were kept. During Julius's appeals process, it was found that a juror came forward during the actual trial to say that another juror used a racial slur when speaking about Julius before their initial deliberation. That juror allegedly said that they should take Julius outside and shoot him. And again, they used a racial slur. The judge concluded this statement was harmless and the juror could still be fair. At this point, Julius is out of appeals and his defense team is hoping for clemency and are working to get him a new trial. The red bandana was eventually tested, which the defense fought long and hard for, and Julius's DNA was on it. However, the defense claims there are three other partial DNA profiles on the bandana and therefore it's not conclusive. And that's where we're at now. No executions have been performed in Oklahoma since 2015 after botched lethal injections made inmates suffer painful and prolonged deaths. Executions were slated to begin again in 2018. Julius's case regained interest recently after Kim Kardashian tweeted about him. Like I said earlier, the documentary The Last Defense shared his story to a national audience as well, and that was in 2017, and I believe they showed it again over the summer as well. So Del, I know at the beginning of the episode, we said that you do believe that Julius is in fact guilty. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? There was an overwhelming amount of evidence that points to Jones's guilt in this case. Mike Hunter, the attorney general of Oklahoma, wrote a report that lays out all the facts that led to Jones's conviction and death sentence. I'm not going to get into all of it here, but these are the facts that stand out. I highly recommend that people read the full report as well as the report from the appeals court that has denied Jones's various appeals. The circumstances around Howell's murder is similar to other crimes that Jones has committed, including a carjacking with a deadly weapon. He pleaded guilty to this crime after his conviction for Howell's murder. Jones is a career criminal. He is alleged to have committed several felonies, including armed robbery of a jewelry store, conspiracy to commit bank robbery, and larceny while in possession of a firearm. Witnesses recall seeing two people in Jordan's car during the night of the murder, and Jones has already admitted to being with Jordan that night. 
Jones has no alibi for the night of the murder. Jones claims that another person was there at the house with him, but that person has evidence that she was at the house the night before the murder. The prosecution had witnesses that claimed that Jones admitted to lying about being home on the night of the murder. During their investigation, lawyers David McKenzie and Malcolm Savage testified that Jones told them his family was mistaken when they told them that he was home on the night of Howell's murder. Jones's then girlfriend, Annalise Presley, also testified that Jones told her that he was on the south side of Oklahoma City on the night of the murder. Jones sent a threatening note to Presley when he found out that she was cooperating with the police. Jones's co-conspirator, Chris Jordan, did get a sweetheart deal from the state. He was given a life sentence, but the first 30 years is suspended. Other witnesses also had deals with the prosecution. These deals are not atypical. Prosecutors routinely make deals with people in return for them turning in their co-defendants. Prosecutors routinely make deals with people who turn on their co-defendants in exchange for a lesser crime or less time. These deals enable the state to gather additional evidence and provide an incentive for people to work with prosecutors. This can be misused, but I don't think that is what happened in this case. There are definitely some issues with the jury and possible bias, but I don't think that erases Jones' guilt. I firmly believe that even if there was a retrial, in my opinion, Jones would still be found guilty. Del, what do you think is the biggest piece of evidence for you personally? So I would say the biggest piece of evidence that convinces me that Jones is guilty is his DNA on the red bandana and the fact that he used that same red bandana in another crime. And I know that there was some other DNA on it, but it was only partial profiles. So that doesn't prove that someone else used it during the commission of a crime. And it just happened to be the same MO that Jones used. Thank you for sharing all of that. It's it's good to show, you know, both sides of the coin to get different opinions. And I definitely, you know, understand why you would feel that way. There's a lot of evidence against Julius. I know I said I think he's innocent, but there is a lot against him. His defense really has to work hard. Um, but again, I'm convinced Julius was wrongfully convicted of a crime he did not commit. To me, there's more evidence that points in the direction of Chris Jordan, especially the statement from Hal's sister saying the murderer was a man with half an inch of hair. And to me, that's my biggest piece of evidence that I witnessed testimony from her. And why did Jordan's story change so many times? If I mean, if he really, you know, was there and was an accomplice, why would he keep changing his story? That doesn't make sense to me. And that doesn't point to innocence, in my opinion. I think Chris got Julius's DNA on that bandana when he stayed in his room. This wouldn't have been something that would be that hard to do, really. You know, you just get a brush, a toothbrush, anything, and rub it on the bandana, and that could give you the DNA. And I don't see why the jailhouse witnesses would lie about Chris bragging. They had nothing to gain. They had death row and life without parole sentences. And police tried to discredit them, but then they took the word of other criminals in the same case. It, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I know a witness claimed to see two men in Jordan's car the night of Paul Howell's murder. And I think who they saw was Chris Jordan and Liddell King. I think Liddell King is maybe downplaying his part in this whole crime. And I do think Julius made bad decisions by not going to the police, especially if he did suspect Chris Jordan and Liddell King were up to something. At the very least, I do think Julius deserves a new trial because the 2002 trial was not fair by any means, in my opinion. He didn't have a proper defense and the jury possibly had racial bias. To me, it looks like there's a lot of pride in the Oklahoma County DA's office and the police office. And I do think they've hidden some information and are corrupt. And we're going to get a little more into that later. Like I said, I think the case against Julius is strong. And I know there isn't definitive proof. It's more circumstantial. But I think reasonable doubt could arise in jurors because of that if he gets a new trial. If I was a juror and I didn't know anything, and if the defense could properly present something, I think I would have reasonable doubt in whether Julius was a murderer or not. And that's really all you need. In relation to the carjacking charge, that carjacking was most likely done by Chris Jordan and 
he again set up Julius. Um, Jordan told was told by police that if he cooperated with them, he'd get leniency and connecting Julius to another carjacking would only help Jordan's case. Julius pled guilty to that other carjacking case to avoid a trial and more legal issues that could hurt his appeals in the murder case. Pleading guilty to the carjacking assured he'd only spend at most 12 years in prison if his murder charge was ever commuted instead of the possible 99 years he could have received if he went to trial for that carjacking. And we've seen innocent people plead guilty to crimes they didn't commit in other cases in order to save themselves. It's not uncommon. Like I've been saying, I very much support Julius's innocence and some people that can help him out are the Pardon and Parole Board of Oklahoma and they have the power to grant him clemency. But it's a little up in the air as to whether or not they will do this because of some recent controversy that's been happening. So in June, the executive director of the Oklahoma Pardon and Parole Board requested a leave of absence after another board member threatened him with a grand jury investigation unless he made efforts to keep death row inmates from seeking commutation hearings. The case that caused this controversy was Julius's case. And the Pardon and Parole Board wanted to see how much power they had in granting a commutation hearing to a death row inmate. The purpose of a commutation hearing is to correct an unjust or excessive sentence. Board member and former DA Alan McCall told the executive director Stephen Bickley he would make accusations of unspecified criminal activity against him if he did not ask the state attorney general to weigh in on whether a request by Jones for a commutation hearing was valid. And this is according to emails compiled in an internal memo that was obtained by a local news website. McCall also stated Bickley was pushing his anti-death penalty opinions on the board. And all I have to say to this is, why are people like this in charge of pardons and paroles? And why are they acting this way? This is ridiculous. This is like petty. I mean, it's petty, but it's also like pretty corrupt, I think, to, you know, threaten someone. If you don't agree with me, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, that I'm going to try to get you investigated. What is that? So going off of this poor behavior, in Julius's case, we saw some poor behavior by Oklahoma City and Edmond police officers. They had a lot of errors in the case. Police seemed to have tunnel vision, and they didn't investigate anyone other than Julius. Police never tested the gun or bandana, and I don't believe they ever fingerprinted Paul Howe's car. They never had Paul Howe's sister look at Jordan or Julius to compare them and, you know, confirm who she saw that night. And like we said earlier, police faced a lot of pressure from the Edmund community because of Paul Howell's status. This is something that commonly happens to police. The public gets swept up and they want answers. They want to feel safe. And like we said, Edmund was shaken after the death of Paul Howell and they felt like any of them could have been next. This desire to solve a crime from police leads to this tunnel vision in an investigation. And when tunnel vision sets in, police can make things fit their narrative. In the early 90s, Officer Teresa Pfeiffer, one of the other lead investigators on Julius's case, allegedly told another officer to lie in the report after the said officer found evidence that pointed to the innocence of their prime suspect in a murder case. The officer filed a complaint against Pfeiffer and he was removed from the case. This suspect in question and the murder in question was Jimmy Ray Slaughter and the murder of his girlfriend and their daughter. And Jimmy Ray Slaughter was executed in 2005. So another possibly innocent man was on death row and eventually executed. I also wanted to note that Bob Macy, the infamous DA in the case, sent 54 people to death row in his career, and half of those convictions were reversed due to issues like prosecutorial misconduct, false forensic scientist testimony, and false informant testimony. Some have claimed that the DA's office would do whatever it took to convict a criminal regardless of ethics, and they showed a blatant disregard for the law. For Julius's case, police really relied on confidential informants to get them information and to help solve the case. Rules on the use of confidential informants vary by jurisdiction. And confidential informants are essentially secret sources for police. 
and they are what some people may call snitches. Issues can arise with informants and police, including accountability, since they rely on secrecy, using incentives for criminals, which leads to a possible public safety issue, and input from people that are not necessarily trustworthy. Most confidential informants are used at the local level to make street-level drug and firearms deals and to build cases against suppliers. They are typically recruited when they are caught selling or using drugs and, again, either convinced or coerced into working with the police to catch the bigger fish. This method of recruiting will tend to draw younger, lower-level criminals like low-level drug dealers and problem drug users which also poses distinct problems. And some informants can actually make a living off of this work. Ventura Benny Martinez became a star informant for the Philadelphia Police Department. He worked alongside the narcotics unit as they took down both legitimate and illegitimate drug scores. And the officers got their arrest numbers up while Martinez got paid for the high volume of targets he ratted out to police. He also helped cover for the police's illicit activity. All of this definitely brings a question of ethics and morals, especially when it comes to the Oklahoma County and Edmond police's use of informants. So let's talk a little bit more about Oklahoma and their prison system and some of their racial past. In 2016, Oklahoma had the highest incarceration rate in the United States. And it actually incarcerates more people than some countries do, which is mind-blowing to me. Prisons are overcrowded, and some prisons are holding double what their capacity should be. Based off 2010 census data, the Oklahoma prison population is predominantly Black. And between 2008 and 2017, the total amount of paroles granted actually dropped 77%. There has been a call to action for criminal justice reform in Oklahoma, and some steps have been taken, including making certain inmates eligible for parole without board hearings. One of our constitutional rights is the right to a fair trial. And like we said, Julius's defense doesn't believe this happened in his case because of a racial bias. Edmund was a predominantly white community at the time of Paul Howell's murder and having a racial outsider commit a crime was unheard of. In 2000, Edmund was 86% white and had a much lower crime rate than both the U.S. and the Oklahoma average. Edmund was a wealthy suburb of Oklahoma City and was a place many white residents moved to during the infamous white flight of the 1950s and 60s, which was essentially white people moving from cities to suburbs to avoid desegregation, essentially, and being around black and brown people. Oklahoma has a racist past like many states in the U.S. do. In 1921, the infamous Tulsa Race Massacre took place in Oklahoma. This involved a white mob looting and burning down an area of the city of Tulsa known as Black Wall Street. 1,200 houses were destroyed, and it's believed 300 people died in the process. In 2015, an Oklahoma University fraternity was filmed saying a racist chant. And I remember hearing about this on the news. And like we said, this question of racism in the jury and the jury selection. And it seems like that did happen here. High courts in Washington, California, and Connecticut have called for or implemented changes to address how implicit bias can keep Black people off of juries unfairly. The first state to do this was Washington, which in 2018 issued a rule requiring judges to consider implicit institutional and unconscious biases in addition to purposeful discrimination. A 2012 North Carolina death penalty case study showed that Black people were removed from juries at more than twice the rate of those of other races. We said United States citizens have a right to a fair trial, and another right we have is to have effective counsel which I don't think Julius received. To prove you had ineffective legal counsel, you need to prove ineffective assistance, and a defendant must show that their trial lawyer's performance fell below an objective standard of reasonableness and a reasonable probability that, but for counsel's unprofessional errors, the result of the proceeding would have been different, which is a question in Julius's case. 
David McKenzie, his lead public defender, said he was very overworked at the time, which is true to what we know about a lot of public defenders' offices. They are usually underfunded and overworked. In New Orleans, for example, a study showed that 60 public defenders were responsible for approximately 20,000 cases a year. In Kansas City, Missouri, public defenders' caseloads include 80 to 100 cases per week. They aren't necessarily given enough time to focus on a single case and create a personal connection with who they're defending. They aren't paid as well as private law firms, which unfortunately creates less incentive to fight and do their best work. According to a 2009 paper by California Western School of Law, Professor Lawrence Benner said, quote, For every dollar spent in California on prosecutors, just 53 cents is spent on public defenders, end quote. And all of this helps to create a system that favors the wealthy. They can afford better lawyers. They can afford to have testing done. They can afford to hire experts, which is unfair and unbalanced. At the core of Julius's case is whether or not a wrongful conviction happened and whether or not an innocent man is on death row. The U.S. criminal justice system is not foolproof and is sometimes inaccurate. A conviction may be classified as wrongful for two reasons. One, the person convicted is factually innocent of the charges. An example of this is when DNA evidence exonerates someone. The Innocence Project reports that since 1989, 375 DNA-based exonerations have taken place. That may seem like a low number, but that represents a total of 4,500 years of time served in jail. Another way a conviction can be classified as wrongful is if there were procedural errors that violated the convicted person's rights. An example of this is when a suspect is not read their Miranda rights. These rights include the right against self-incrimination and access to a lawyer before questioning begins. The number of exonerations has been rising since 1989, but we have to remember that 1989 is actually when studies have started on exonerations and when they were really starting to be counted. Experts say the increase in the rate of exonerations can be explained in part by a growing trend of accountability in prosecutorial offices around the country. So there are two cases of wrongful conviction that I wanted to go over. And often wrongful convictions happen because false or misleading forensic science and jailhouse informants. So the first case is that of Stephen Avery from Making a Murderer. He was actually found innocent of sexual assault in the 80s after serving time for the crime. Another famous case of a wrongful conviction and exoneration is Walter McMillan, whose case was featured in the book Just Mercy and its movie adaptation. McMillan, a black man, was wrongfully convicted of killing a white woman in Alabama. Unfortunately, the history of the United States has a lot of black men being killed for supposedly pursuing or wanting white women, if you just look at the case of Emmett Till as another example of this happening. The case of Emmett Till is very sad and brutal and just disgusting. And it's one that I hope we can cover at another point. Going off of this wrongful conviction is the fact that Julius was sentenced to death. So if he is innocent, there is an innocent man on death row. The death penalty is supposed to be reserved for only the worst of the worst crimes, but Legally irrelevant factors such as race, geography, and the quality of counsel disproportionately determine who is sentenced to death. The first established death penalty laws date as far back as the 18th century BC in the Code of King Hammurabi of Babylon, which codified the death penalty for 25 different crimes. And I remember learning about this in like high school social studies class, I'm sure other people have as well. Britain influenced America's use of the death penalty more than any other country. And when European settlers came to the New World, they brought the practice of capital punishment with them. The first recorded execution in the new colonies was that of Captain George Kendall in the Jamestown colony of Virginia in 1608. And Kendall was executed for being a spy for Spain. There are nearly 3,000 people on death row, right now, and every year on average, five are exonerated. 
Of the 195 United Nations countries, 55 have capital punishment. Amnesty International reported that at least 26,604 people were known to be on death rows around the world at the end of 2019. The U.S. is the only country in the Americas to have the death penalty. Del, what are your thoughts on the death penalty? So I think that the death penalty is something that should be outlawed across the world and definitely in the United States. The death penalty is a barbaric practice and there is no way to ensure that you are not executing someone that has been unjustly convicted of a crime. If you look at the stats associated with the death penalty, you'll also see that it's not an actual deterrent to crime. A deterrent only works if people actually believe that it's going to be levied against them. And most criminals don't actually believe that they're going to be caught. I believe that criminals that commit the most heinous crime should be punished with life imprisonment without parole. I completely agree. I don't like it. I think it's wrong. I do think it is barbaric. It's outdated. And in my opinion, if we're... We have the ability with the death penalty to execute an innocent person and if we do that to one that's one too many for me activists against the death penalty agree with the reasons we stated too they believe it's outdated and barbaric it's applied discriminatorily and generally biased against black americans when we're talking about the death penalty in the u.s and it's not an effective way to reduce crime People say it's arbitrary, and it is more costly than incarceration due in part to litigation costs. At least 4.1% of defendants sentenced to death in the U.S. are innocent, and that's according to the National Academy of Sciences. Most cases in which the death penalty is sought do not end up with the death penalty being imposed. And once a death sentence is imposed, the most likely outcome of the case is the conviction or death sentence will be overturned in the courts. Most defendants who are sentenced to death essentially end up spending life in prison, but just at a highly inflated cost. So I just want to give two examples of people that were executed, but are now believed to be innocent of the crimes they were executed for. The first one is Ruben Cantu. He was executed in Texas in 1993 after being convicted of felony murder during an attempted robbery at the age of 17. The key witness in the case later came forward and said he felt pressured by the police to identify Cantu. And his co-defendant admitted Cantu wasn't there the night of the murder. Also in Texas, which is no surprise because Texas and Florida lead the country in executions, they executed David Spence in 1997 for murdering teenage girls. Multiple officers believed Spence to be innocent as there was no physical evidence or really any evidence to prove he was a murderer. It is believed that an overzealous narcotics officer narrowed in on David after receiving information from prison inmates who were granted favors in return for their testimony. I really, in our lifetime, would like to see the death penalty in the U.S become I guess illegal or overturned I don't know if it's going to happen but I just really hope this and criminal justice reform is what we are moving to yes I definitely believe that the death penalty is unconstitutional I think it's cruel and unusual punishment and I definitely agree with you that I hope that in our lifetimes that the people with the power to make the changes actually make those changes oh that's so well said though it's on us to help Julius if you feel he's innocent and would like to support him, visit justiceforjulius.com. We'll link this on our social media accounts as well. There you'll find a petition to sign, which has over 6 million signatures, and an email to send to the Pardon and Parole Board. Emailing them is very important because, like we said, they have the power to grant Julius clemency. You can also contact Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt. We'll link um, his contact information below, but you can either email him or give him a call at 405-521-2342. And Governor Stitt has the ability to commute Julius's sentence. I've donated to Julius's defense, I've signed the petition, and I email the parole board several times a week. It's something I'm very passionate about, and if you feel the same way as I do, I hope you are emboldened to take action as well. And I really encourage everyone to look more into the case for themselves. You know, we had a split decision here, but it's important, you know, to do some more digging and 
see what you think. But again, if you do think he's innocent, take action. And if you think there are any wrongfully convicted people, anyone else that you're aware of, please take action for them as well, too. This public pressure really is getting stuff done. And it's a really, it's a great thing to see happen, mainly because of social media. And I definitely agree with that. I think that it's important to have your voices heard, especially when you are defending the rights of someone who doesn't have the full capacity to defend their own rights because they're currently within the prison system. So that wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know what you think in the comments about the Julius Jones case. Make sure you click the subscribe button You can find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube every Wednesday with a new episode. And make sure you leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc. Please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any amount you can get. This is Janine Dale signing off. Stay safe.